in Bible class this morning, Lord willing, we'll cover 1 Timothy 5, where God tells family members and members of the church to be sensitive to the needs of widows and to honor them and to take care of them. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 5.3 says, Honor widows who are widows indeed. Widows and orphans were the epitome of vulnerability in the ancient world. It's estimated that in the first century, roughly 30% of Rome's population were widows. And while I couldn't find statistics on orphans, there were a lot. <laughs> and you were considered an orphan if either one or both of your parents had died. And there were several factors that contributed to the high likelihood of someone becoming either a widow or an orphan. Number one, poor health care. If you got a disease or a serious injury back then, they didn't have our advances in medicine. And so your life was much more fragile. They didn't have organizations like the CDC or the FDA to try to, you know, keep food safety rules and sanitation laws. And so average life expectancy was just lower in general. Secondly, war for men, childbirth for women. Many men died in battle. Many women died in childbirth. Thirdly, wide gaps in marital age. In the Greco-Roman culture, the men, and it depended whether you were a Greek or Roman, a little different difference there, but um, anywhere from 5 to 20 years was the gap between the man and the woman. The man was usually anywhere from 5 to 20 years older than the woman or many times a teenage girl that they married. So many times the husband would die long before his wife, leaving her widowed and leaving his children without a father. Marriages typically only lasted 15 to 20 years before the husband died. Think about the story of Anna in Luke chapter 2, who was only married for seven years, it says, before her husband died. And then she lived as a widow until 84. As for children becoming orphans, these are all very surprising statistics. Some scholars estimate that by the time a child reached the age of 15, 45% of them would have lost their fathers. By the time they reached the age of 25, 70% of them would have lost their fathers. Now, sometimes widows would end up okay financially. Sometimes their husbands would leave them a lot of wealth as kind of an inheritance. They would also, she would also get the dowry back that her father paid to her husband on the day of their wedding. Sometimes the dowry was enough to support her. She could move back in with her parents who could support her and she would be okay. Sometimes she would have children who were old enough, especially sons, old enough to work and to, to help support her as well. But many times widows were not well off at all. She might not have living parents anymore. The dowry may not have been that much at all. Her kids might be too young to support her or she might not have kids at all. So on top of her grief and her loneliness, she would be largely dependent on the charity of others. If you think about it, emotionally and, and socially and economically, widows and orphans were the epitome of vulnerability and helplessness. And what's so amazing about the God we serve is that he knows that and he cares for their plight. Let's get into God's Word. Look in Deuteronomy 14 with me, please. Deuteronomy 14. <clears throat> I just want to show you throughout this lesson how much God cares about orphans and widows. Deuteronomy 14. He tells the Israelites, if you look with me in verse 28 and 29, Deuteronomy 14, 28, he says, at the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and shall deposit it in your town. 
The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the foreigner, the orphan and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. See, God made a way for orphans and widows to be perpetually taken care of in Israel. Let me give you another example of this. Look in Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24, this is a separate law about what the Israelites were supposed to do. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 24, look in verse 19. Deuteronomy 24, 19, down through 22. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the foreigner, for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the foreigner, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the foreigner, for the orphan, and for the widow. <clears throat> for you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. God made amazing provisions for widows and orphans among his people. And what's more, his passion, his love was so deep for those who were the most vulnerable in society that if you were to abuse the vulnerable, if you were to abuse widows and orphans, you would inflict, you, you would ignite rather the wrath of God which would then be inflicted upon you. Listen to what God says in Exodus 22. He says, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict him at all, and if he cries out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. That is strong language, strong passion. And the tragic thing is, when you fast forward in Israel's history, especially around the time of the, the major and, and minor prophets, God's people were pretending to be religious. They were wearing his name as if they were his people and bragging, especially in Judah, that, hey, we have the temple of God among us all the while. While all the while, they were neglecting and even taking advantage of orphans and widows. So it should not be surprising that God sent Assyria and sent Babylon to destroy Israel like he said he would because of their treatment of orphans and widows. They had kindled his wrath. For instance, in Isaiah 1, God tells his people, I don't care about your worship anymore. He says, I don't take any pleasure in the blood of bulls or goats, or lambs, and your offerings to me are worthless. And here's what he tells them to do instead. In Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. And when Jesus came, he embodied the same care and compassion for widows and orphans that his father had. In fact, as part of his searing rebuke against the Pharisees, Jesus condemned them for, quote, devouring widows' houses. Now, there's debate and question about exactly what that means. Maybe they were, you know, trying to be righteous and say, well, we'll help this widow by taking over her estate and kind of helping her with her finances and then stealing from them. Whatever it was, it absolutely infuriated Jesus because they were doing exactly what so many of the Old Testament prophets condemned Israel for doing, pretending to be righteous, pretending to be God's people, and they don't care a thing about widows and orphans, those who are most vulnerable among them. Look with me in Luke 7. Luke 7. A few weeks ago, Dave Weaver read from this passage, Luke 7. Just a touching story, verse 11 through 15, Luke 7, 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him. 
accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. She had lost her only son. She had already lost her husband. That was bad enough. But at least she had an older son to be there with her and also to work and to help financially support her. But then she lost him too, her only son. So on top of the tremendous grief and loneliness that she felt, she was going to be in dire straits financially. And when Jesus looked at her, he felt nothing but compassion for her plight. Raised her son from the dead, gave her her son back. Yes, she would still be a widow, but not completely left alone and untaken care of. As another example, remember when Jesus taught us about persistence in prayer. And he talked about how there was this really wicked judge, really evil guy, just stubborn. But there was a widow who kept coming to him pleading her case over and over again in, in her persistence. And eventually, even that stubborn, evil judge who doesn't really care you know, about doing what's right, even he felt compassion eventually and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you what you want. And Jesus says, how much more will God, who's a righteous and good judge and actually cares about orphans and widows, how much more will he grant her plea and grant yours if you stay persistent in prayer? Jesus also saw a widow put in all that she had as an offering at the temple, and he was impressed by her heart. And of course, as he was hanging on the cross, he looked out at his mother, and he said, woman, behold your son. But he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about John. And he said to John, behold your mother. And the text says, from that very hour, John took her into his own household to take care of her. Now, there's some question and debate about where in the world is Joseph? Where is Jesus's earthly father? And most people seem to think he was dead by this time. That would not necessarily be surprising in that ancient world. And if that's the case, Jesus's mother, Mary, was a widow. And Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, one of the very final things he does before he dies is make sure that a widow, his mother, is taken care of. And while there isn't an explicit passage about Jesus taking care of orphans, he was sensitive to leaving his disciples behind. On the night before his death, he promised them in John 14, 27, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And I think that first and foremost was a reference to his resurrection. <laughs> He's not going to stay gone. He'll be raised in three days to be back with them. I think it's also by extension. Jesus will be with them through the comfort of the Holy Spirit that he's going to send. And, of course, the ultimate fulfillment of not leaving them as orphans and, and coming to them will be in his final return where he'll come back and now they can actually be united with their heavenly father forever. And here's why all this matters for us. You and I are the widows and orphans Jesus came to care for. Look in Psalm 68 with me. Psalm 68. This is a psalm praising God for his deliverance. <clears throat> Psalm 68 praises God in verses 5 and 6. It says, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Now here's my question. Who were the lonely that God made a home for 
in this context? Who were the prisoners God brought to prosperity? Who were the poor, fatherless orphans and widows in this context? It was Israel when they were in Egypt. If you continue reading in verses 7 through 10, he's going to describe God leading them out of Egypt, taking care of them through the wilderness and bringing them to the promised land of Canaan. He says in verse 7, O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched. Your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O God. God's people were the poor and the downtrodden and the vulnerable in this passage when they were back in Egypt. Spiritually speaking, while they were in Egypt, they had no father and they had no husband to take care of them. Yet God called them out to become his children and to be their husband to provide for all of their needs. It's fascinating. After the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians, when Judah was hauled off into captivity, Jeremiah says in Lamentations 5, verse 3, We have become orphans without a father, and our mothers are like widows. I believe he was referencing... God's promise in Exodus 22 about how if they neglected orphans and widows, one day they would feel God's wrath and they themselves would become orphans and widows because of their sin. That's exactly what it was like in captivity. Physically, because many of them died by the hands of the Babylonians, they didn't have fathers or or husbands, but more importantly, spiritually, because of their sin, they had become separated from their spiritual father in heaven, their spiritual husband. And the same was true of us when we were in spiritual captivity to Satan. We were all like the prodigal son who regarded our father in heaven as good as dead. Orphans trying to make it on our own in a world that doesn't care for us. We were like widows with no husband to take care of us. And then Jesus came. (laughs) Jesus came to show us our father and our husband had not died. but We were the ones who died. And our father and our husband longed to resurrect us and unite us to him forever. Jesus cared for us when we were the epitome of vulnerability and helplessness. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. As spiritual orphans and widows, we were filled with grief and loneliness, with no support. We were abused and taken advantage of by Satan. Yet in Christ, we have been adopted into God's family. We have been betrothed to God so that we will never need or want again. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let's thank God and Jesus that they cared so much for helpless widows and orphans like us.